Kia ora, I'm Dr Helen Fulcher and today we're talking about maximising the health of our older patients. With me is Professor Nari Kurs, a general practitioner and academic with a strong focus on the healthcare of older people. Welcome Nairi. Thanks Helen, good to be here. To start Nari, can we look at how we define our older population in New Zealand? Oh look, that's a really good question. You know, when I was young, we used to nudge each other when we saw somebody who was 90 and now they're everywhere. So we know that the demography is changing. Statutorily, of course it's 65 when the pension becomes available, but actually in clinical and functional focuses it's probably much older. And remember that variability, some 90 year olds are running marathons and some 65 year olds have advanced disease and are in nursing homes. So I would say somewhere around 75, certainly by 80, 85, we're thinking about the common issues with older people. Are there tools that we use, Nari, to assess frailty at all? Oh, that's a good question. So, of course, with um, the variability of uh, that uh, presents itself in older populations, frailty is a very good thing, can be hidden. Frailty is a reserve. Of course, in the beginning, frailty was slowness, weakness, low levels of activity, exhaustion and weight loss. Kind of complicated to get your head around, but there's some very simple tools like the clinical frailty scale, which are quite useful. And they can be useful because people who are frail need extra attention need to be careful about challenging them too much with things, Need the, certainly the surgeons and all the uh, people who do invasive things need to know about it. So Nairi, our older population are of increasing importance in healthcare. Mm -hmm. What are the differences in ethnicity that we see out there in New mm. Zealand? Okay, well that's a very topical question because of course the different ethnic groups in New Zealand are ageing as well and particularly Māori Pacific and Asian populations are ageing faster. Mm. Doesn't mean they're getting older faster, but it means the proportion of people in those older age groups are increasing at a greater rate than for the regular Pākehā mainstream population. So for instance, um, where we will see a doubling of the people over 65 in Pākehā population by 2026, we will see a tripling and a quadrupling of Māori and Pacific and Asian populations. Mm. The differences for those ethnic groups are really intriguing. And I think you all know from your own experience that different ethnic groups react differently. What are the attitudes towards older people? In general, Māori in particular and Pacific and uh, some Asian groups really revere their older people, look after them very well. That means that people with sometimes significant levels of disability are looked after at home. The family are often under stress and you, we need to be very careful to have maximum support available. And that support has to be ethnically appropriate. And so there's lots of work around New Zealand now trying to, to do that better. But for us as GPs, I think you just need to know your patients, as you always do, and um, try to do things as, you, as best you can for them. I also think that for um, ethnic groups, also remember that the disparities that are present throughout the ages really do persist into old age. So earlier onset of disability, greater um, levels of disability, uh, less recovery after significant events really have to do the best you can, do more for those minority ethnic groups um, whenever you can. What are the new things that are becoming important for ageing well? <laughs> oh, this is a great topic. <laughs> so I think we're all realising that um, ageing starts when we're born. <laughs> so therefore, when you think about ageing now, for somebody who's 85, understand that their whole life or their life course has contributed to that. So we know that cognitive um, challenge is very good for brains and that the brains can continue to make brain cells. When I went to medical school, we were told that you could only lose your brain cells, but now we can make brain cells. So that means that ongoing promotion of stuff that will challenge the brain is very important. Same with mobility. So with mobility, the falls prevention or the falls stuff is really topical right now, especially because ACC is promoting exercise classes in the, in the community and for people at home. That change in balance happens much, much younger. And so we're all thinking about backing up and doing more preventive stuff in midlife, and that can be really important. Also for people who are uh, of an older age, who potentially have disability, I think we have to remember that it's not just all a downhill trend. Things fluctuate. When people are sick, they will get better, just like younger age groups. So I guess the main new things are looking at that nexus of cognition and mobility, looking at how the brain and the, and the body work together, looking also at how mood does impact and, um, and 
and affect the way people manage their lives. Individu individual independence is also important. I guess the other new things that we're all m very aware of is that people will have multiple medications. Mm -hmm. And they have multiple medications because they accrue things. We have a health system which picks up those things, which treats them, and so the guidelines are pretty silent on multimorbidity, so we're all challenged by um, certainly the multimorbidity in ways that medications have become problematic over the years. Okay, Nairi, what are your tips for getting the conversations about ageing well into our consultations? Okay, look, this is very topical as well because, of course, with this idea that there's a life course behind ageing, getting conversations about cognition, getting conversations about getting older in a healthy way into the family, into the whānau is important. So did you know that leg length is strongly predictive of who gets, um, who gets dementia? This has been shown from low and middle income countries. And of course, remember low and middle income countries, nutrition in, at the time of birth is very important. So short stature means poor nutrition, probably less brain development, probably goes with all those other things that are also happening to people. So getting that conversation, good stimulation for children, lots of exercise and activity before, particularly around the teenage years. If you are thinking about a career, do a difficult career. It's good for your brain. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess when we're th thinking about the things we usually do, managing cardiovascular disease, also very important for ageing, also very important for cognition. Exercise, make it challenging, cognitively challenging, interesting exercise to give you some cognitive challenge as well. Build up your cognitive reserve as much as you can. I also think that tips for getting um, things into conversations. So of course older people come for their medication renewals. It's a huge opportunity for a little bit of preventive talk, see how things are going, are there issues coming along and um, can you make some positive changes earlier on to forestall onset of disability. I guess disability is what I think about as being the bad thing, but then also know that people who are disabled can have very independent lives. So it's a complex mix of things. Okay, so one other thing that I find is quite useful is that, you know, older people don't like to think about falls prevention because it makes them feel old and decrepit. So you can approach it by saying, okay, so how are you going with staying strong and staying strong and living longer? Well, you know, you don't be too cheesy, but you know, are you keeping up your strength? Can you do the things that you need to do? How can we help you with some exercise? Remember, balance is really important. And if you're noticing issues there, we can do that. The big things that people don't want to talk about, of course, are incontinence and erectile dysfunction. They are things that you have to work around. I think as a GP, you're in a very privileged situation because the people will tell you things and be aware, be awake to the prompts and do, you know, probe a little bit deeper. But yes, keep it positive. Older people want to be, the, in fact, I have a, some lovely older patients who say, no, no, I'm not old, that person over there is. And of course, this person is 85 and that person 72. So it's all perception. What are factors that might affect people's health outcomes as they age? There are many factors. I think we all, as GPs, should talk about medications more. Mm -hmm. And the complex medications that pe people are on and the way they interact are very important to health outcomes. So the commonest thing that I find when I forget is I give my older patient with statins uh, an antibiotic like erythromycin or roxithromycin. They have sore muscles, they come back and tell me off. So um, understanding what those interactions are, trying to avoid them. I also think that what we get stuck with too is treating a side effect from a medication with another medication rather than backing up a little bit and thinking, okay, what is that? Is it from the medication? Should we be altering doses or changing the medication uh, frequencies or whatever rather than misdiagnosing those um, drug side effects as a new condition. Mm -hmm. So always remember to treat the underlying condition. I guess that's the main mm -hmm. message. And if you're treating the underlying condition with a medication that gives you a side effect, understand about that side effect. So I think that this thing called a regular medication review is very hard to do. Um, but I think you always have to have it in your mind. One of my professors, when I was young, um, told me that if an older person goes off, we used to use that term, we don't use it anymore. Um, if an older person gets suddenly more unwell or something's not going on, you should blame yourself for poisoning them until proven otherwise. So be careful with the medications that we use and look out for those poisonings. As you know, Helen, we've talked about how chronological age is not a very good indicator of uh, whether you get 
poor, good or poor outcome. So understanding the underlying function mm. of the person is important. That frailty can be measured and can be put into the equation. Remember those physiological things that change with age. So kidney function always goes down. I think I'm pretty sure about, I can say that. Um, and so the drugs that you get will change over time. So will have a different impact over time as that kidney function reduces. Other conditions that people get will make them more or less susceptible. So individualising that approach is something that really only GPs can do because they really do understand the patients and you've seen them probably for a long time. You know what their tolerances are, you know what your tolerances are. And I think together you can work out what the goals of this treatment regime are for this person. Mm. And sometimes, sometimes it's better not to treat something. And that's a very hard decision to make. As part of maximising health of our older patients, we should be rationalising the medications. Can we talk about this, Nairi? Oh yes, should's a very good word, isn't it? Okay, so rationalising, yes, I totally agree with. I have to put my hand up and say I'd, I, I'm not really a de-prescribing person because that implies just stopping everything. But what we've got to do is optimise and rationalise, which means um, making the medication more appropriate. And so appropriate can mean you've got too much of this, stop it, but it also mean you're missing out on this and you need more of it. So thinking about that is really important. So in older people, yes, we do really have to be careful about certain areas. So pain management is really important. So pain is underdiagnosed and undermanaged. So that's a hard one. We definitely don't want to sign up to long-term opioids. That's definitely not good for people. Thinking in older people about that cognitive reserve, if they've got less cognitive reserve, we're much more susceptible to combinations, things like pain medications, anticholinergics, CNS depressants, and of course their antidepressants. So it's a complicated area, but simple, small things that you can do will make a huge difference. And I would really encourage everybody to take charge of the medications because you're the one who has to deal with all the things that happen. So yes, they might have three or four specialists doing this or that, but you're the one who has to rationalise it and put it together. And I've been known to ring up people and say, well, you know, about this and this and this, how about this and that and that, and you should be doing that regularly. I'm always looking things up. Do they need the lower dose because the kidney functions X, Y, or Z? Yes, we need to treat their gout. I know there's something about allopurinol and lower dose, but you can titrate quite highly, could that quite high in older people as well. So also remember when you're managing pain that the interaction or the, or the, or the contribution of mood to pain is quite significant. And so is it actually thinking about the positivity or their life circumstances that need some treatment or is it actually the pain? So can you change things and use a non-pharmacological way of managing pain? For instance, arthritis of the knee, exercises and quad strengthening works just as better than pain medication. So thinking more broadly, I also know that um, older people for uh, for exercise challenge Tai Chi and Qigong and those kind of things are quite good for mood as well as balance. So thinking about the breadth of things that might be available might be just as useful as trying to use medications. I think we all know that for older people the main goals that they have are about quality of life. It's the uh, quality of life, not the length of life that's important. And so trying to work with them to set some goals around that quality of life might mean that you're less likely to use medications and more likely to use other treatments. Or that the older person can understand that treating this is likely to lead to a significant side effect and maybe they might choose not to take that option. Nari, what are your take home messages about maximising the health for our older patients? <laughs> Okay, so first I just want to say that your enthusiasm for your older patients will keep them going no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. That they sometimes like to just come and see you because they've known you for a while and you're on their side. So keep that advocacy going for older people. Enjoy spending time with older people. I'm always loving their stories. Medically health related, I think it's important to think about frailty and to think about individualising what you do with them related to their underlying function. Mm -hmm. Always, I think, prevention, 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 that's because I've got a bit of a public health bent too, but that happens across the whole life course. And so if you can get some messages in early, that might well help your older persons when they, when they get there. Um, physiological decline, thinking about poor health and poor health outcomes might mean that your medicines need to be rationalised more often. 
I like, you've already got a podcast, you know, about rationalising, optimising and individualising things. And I think that's a, that's a really good way to think about medication use in older people. So I'd just like to encourage you to keep taking care of those older people. I think it's a lot of fun and we should all celebrate it more. Thank you, Nairi. That was fantastic. I'm glad I could be here and thanks for having me.